Hi, I'm Stefan. Um, I've been working in the internet industry now for a little more than 20 years. Founded my first company in 1998, brought it public, and I built the company for almost 10 years and sold it. And ever since, I'm investing my own money and the money of some business angel friends in mostly tech and internet startups. This episode is brought to you by WHU, the Otto Beisheim School of Management. WHU is reshaping the way students learn about business, management, finance, and entrepreneurship through its innovative programs and partnerships in Germany and across the globe. To learn more about this globally ranked university, visit whu.edu today. Hey folks, Garrett here. In this episode, we introduce Stefan Schubert entrepreneur, investor, and managing partner at STS Ventures and Cone. We're talking early stage investing, building sustainable ventures, entrepreneurial ecosystems, and a lot more. So for you listeners out there who are on your own startup journey and want valuable insights into the mind of an incredibly successful entrepreneur and investor, this episode is for you. Hope you enjoy it. Coming to you from WHU. On the banks of the Rhine River, in beautiful Fallendar, Germany, this is the best and most awesome founder podcast. A show about entrepreneurs, innovators, advisors, and educators, and the stories that make them who they are today. All right, Stefan Schubert from STS Ventures. Thank you so much for uh, having me in your lovely offices in Köln today. Thank you for visiting us and uh, having me in this podcast. It's uh, it's always wonderful to meet people out of the Vehau ecosystem that have uh, really lived the entrepreneurial life for a long period of time. So um, as I've only been on campus for about a year, I've been learning more and more about some of these tremendous founder stories. So I'm really excited to, to sit down and hear a little bit more about yours. Um, what I like to do with all of the guests is kind of start at the beginning. I think every founder, every entrepreneur has a unique entrepreneurial journey where where they started and how they got to where they are today. So I was hoping you could start kind of telling us your story of um, when you first became an entrepreneur and how that journey took you to today in STS Ventures. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, I always say I'm in my second entrepreneurial life. My first entrepreneurial life was uh, started in 1998 when I uh, was still working at McKinsey and I had a, a leaf year and I decided to build a website uh, that was presenting financial market information to private investors. So kind of like a, a Bloomberg for private investors. We called it on Vista, we brought it live and I, my plan was to go back to McKinsey. But then this website all of a sudden grew tremendously and apparently we had invented something that people wanted. Now. It took us nine years to really uh, make this company large because 1998 was still a different uh, era. There was no Google marketing, so we just could grow um, by voice. Uh, how do you say? Mouth of uh, word of mouth. Yeah. Word of mouth. Um, but over the time, the website became fairly large. It was um, and still is today one of the largest websites with financial information for private investors in Germany. Uh, we managed to generate enough uh, advertising revenue so that this business became very profitable at the time. And we spinned off two other businesses, actually. One was, um, which today you would call a fintech SaaS business. It was a licensed business because many um, brokers, banks, media companies came up and wanted licenses, wanted websites the way we had built them. And then we had our own unit with, at the end, 125 developers building these kind of websites and operating these kind of websites for these customers. And the third company, because advertising at the beginning was very hard, we tried to monetize our users. And the third company we founded lately was, was Ligatos, which out of these users made leads for specific financial products. And we sold all these three companies um, between 2005 and 2007. So we actually had three exits. Um, and uh, this experience of actually building three companies, hiring 450 people in seven countries, um, was something that I later on wanted to bring to the ecosystem. And so for the last 10 to 12 years, I've been investing in all kinds of um, interesting, smaller businesses. And lately, 
in the last four or five years almost only tech and internet startups because that's where I think I have the most knowledge and I can bring the most to the table. Let's talk about that a little bit because now you've you've taken your success with on on Vista and the two other companies with it into into STS. Can you tell us a little more about STS Ventures? Are you a VC? Are you a, a syndicate of angels? And can you tell me a little bit more about this organization? For many t- years, we've been just an angel, my own money. Now over the years, we've learned how this asset class can work and produce um, performance turn uh, financial performance and so in the last three four years we have extended the network to what you call um, maybe a business angel network Um, so we have some syndicate angels behind us but in the front it's only me it's my company and uh, that's actually neat for our founders when we invest they don't have to deal with um, a long cap table of 10 business angel investors they only deal with one person and everything else, whether there's other people syndicating with us, is not their business. That makes it very easy on one hand. On the other hand, it gives us a little more financial power than a normal angel, meaning that um, we like to invest very early, but at a relatively large ticket, between two and 500,000 seat tickets. So we're typically the largest angel when we invest in these early companies, but we have the financial power with the syndication Um, possibility to invest up to 5 million euro in one company. So I don't know what we are. Mentality is more an angel. Um, Size is not a VC, but somewhere in between. And that's maybe a relatively interesting position right now because there are many, many angels. There are many VCs that have become larger and larger. But in in between, there has always been and there still is a relative significant gap, which I think we can fill. Well, it sounds like you are kind of bridging that gap a little bit. And I have some experience. I built a company in Germany in 2010. And when we got to the point of capitalization, it was still pretty hard to find sophisticated angels that had really tech experience. You know, there was plenty of high net worth folks that were just starting to dabble, but they were tended to be pretty aggressive with their investments and their cap tables. On the flip side, there were some VCs. But it's always tricky with the VCs and when you get in on the fund, if you're getting in on year seven of the fund, you're going to get pushed pretty aggressively. Um, Can you talk a little bit about how you kind of do those investments as well? Like, do you have, it sounds like you don't have a fund, so you might have a little more flexibility kind of in timelines. Do you take board seats? Can you talk a little bit about what a typical investment from STS looks like? Yeah, maybe it's interesting to talk about what we look for. We don't look so much for the next unicorn, because a lot of these unicorns are very equity story driven, very capital intensive, something something where we say um, it it doesn't work too many times. So it's it's there's there's many, many things that have to fall together. So these these exits work. Of course, if you read about them in the newspaper later, it's always fantastic. But if you look at it from a statistical side, it's very rare that these stories actually work out. So what we look for is more the the German the new German Mittelstand, the technology internet Mittelstand. So we love exits between, let's say, 20 and 100 million euro. Meaning, I'm not against having an exit of a billion euro. Um, if, if it happens, it's great. But I'm looking for businesses that don't have to get into that size. Having said that, we can look at total different businesses at the typical as the typical VC does. Um, so we. I like businesses where on a, on, a, on a beer deckle we say, you know, this could actually work. Uh, revenue could be higher than costs and this could also work at a revenue of, of 5 million euro. But it can be a business that generates 100 million euro revenue, but it doesn't have to. And that's a big difference. So I try to find businesses that can become profitable relatively early in their life cycle and where there's always a plan B to say, okay, if this large, huge story doesn't work, then we always have the possibility to say, okay, let's do it with 3 million euro and we're profitable. Um, Having this this airbag in there and saying it it works, it it can work. Um, And investing in these kind of businesses, we are often from, if you put us in a VC bucket, more or less the only VC that looks at these kind of businesses. Because if you're a VC with a 300 million euro fund, 
you will never return your fund with these kind of investments. For us, um, having other ticket sizes and, and having a different agenda, it might be pretty interesting to generate four, five, six times money with these kind of investments, especially if you look at our failure rate, because that's a big difference to the VCs. You know, if they go for the large bets and try to, to create large companies, statistically, the failure rate has to be and, and is pretty high. Now, since we are investing a lot of times in relatively boring businesses, our failure rate is significantly below the market. Um, to give you a number, out of 50 investments we have done in the last 10 years, we've written off only four. Um, when I have this failure rate, this very low failure rate, it's much easier to generate uh, returns because I don't need these 10x multiples. I'm very happy with four or five times multiples. And then I come to a position where I say, it's relatively easy to build a company that is worth 30, 40, 50 million euro. There are many buyers um, who buy these kind of companies as opposed to building a, building a billion dollar company, which is very rare and very hard to sell. So I'm doing something that is more boring, but is easier and more frequent. Um, and in that position, I think we're pretty unique. Does, does that put you in a situation where you deal with more kind of those zombie investments since you're not going, you know, a lot of VCs will count on that nine figure exit from their fund to cover the losses of everything else, including the ones that are in that zombie state that aren't really moving. If you're not aiming for these ex extravagant uh, exits and you're kind of playing more that middle ground a little bit more, does that put you at higher risk of having some investments that are not big growth curves, not the classic hockey sticks that might be harder to potentially exit, but could be a good lifestyle business or generate good revenue? That's probably the case, but the reason is not the strategy. The reason is that we dive in very early. So if you invest seed, you have much more risk that the team and the business model work at all. So the typical Series A VC has seen traction. He has seen that the the founders are doing a good job. He has seen that there's revenue. So yes, we sometimes invest in companies that after two years still don't have revenue because it just doesn't work. But then you have to see, you know, if you invest two, three hundred, four hundred thousand euro in such a company, it's a risk you can probably take. Would you call yourself an active or a passive investor? Are you guys pretty hands-on with your companies? Or? Yeah, we're very hands-on and that's something we tell our teams before we invest. And I always call myself a co-entrepreneur. Uh, I don't want to be an investor so much. I'm not someone who is interested in the next larger investment round because it's good in my reporting numbers. Um, I really try to understand the businesses. I really try to understand the figures behind the business. And I try to work with the teams on their, on their entrepreneurial journey. And that leads to a situation where a lot of times we understand the numbers and the numbers behind the numbers, how the numbers are derived, much better than most other investors in these companies. And where every once in a while we call a team and say, you know, we need to have a dinner. There's something we haven't seen yet. Um, maybe you should think of your business being a little 10 degrees more to the right. And why don't you try this and that? So we're constantly thinking about our portfolio companies as if we were running the business. Um, for some teams, this is really good. They love it. It's a great ping pong game. Um, others don't like it that much because, of course, uh, you know, we, are, we are in interaction with them. So that's why I say right at front, we want founders that like that and that um, embrace that right. type of investment. You know, I tell a lot of 
a lot of first-time founders that you're not bringing on an investor. Really, you need to think of this like you're bringing on a business partner. You know, you want someone that you're working with. And that actually segues into the another question that I have about, about STS. You guys are seem to be uniquely positioned that you're not just that seed stage uh, business angel, but you have the ability to potentially carry on. Do you often get pro ratas and do follow on financing, follow up in A rounds and, and participate farther down the line? Or do you strictly try to stay with seed? No, absolutely. Yeah. If, if we like the company and the team, we get along with them well, and we see that there are larger financing rounds coming, that's exactly our position to say then we are the angels that can go on and not just take the dilution. And that's interesting because if you get a 10 or 15 percent stake in an early stage of the company and you can keep that by preventing your dilution in later rounds, um, you can have a relatively significant stake although you are a relatively small investor. You don't have to invest the 20 million tickets which we never could. So I've talk, we've talked a little bit about the types of investments that you make and the types of companies you look for. I want to ask you a little bit more on the softer side. Is I'm sure you've heard pitches from hundreds and hundreds of founders. What types of characteristics do you look for in the founders that you want to partner with? That's actually the toughest question, um, a question we always ask ourselves because you know, over 50 investments, we have seen people where we were really questioning ourselves with this is a team we should invest in and they turn out to be great entrepreneurs and the other way around. So what I always say is if you do, um, let's say you have an HR hiring process, it's probably relatively easy to find out if someone is a good bookkeeper, if someone is a good IT guy. Maybe it's also possible to find out if someone is a great sales guy. but interviewing an entrepreneur is really tough because an entrepreneur not only needs a certain skill set and a good education but it takes so much more you know, it needs to convince uh, customers investors uh, you need to convince employees and, and 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 be a leader and be someone they trust in so there's so many things you can study and so many things that that are hard to find out with a 25 year old who hasn't shown that in the past that I think that's the biggest problem of our industry. And that's maybe also why uh, larger VCs say, we first want to see that before we invest. Now, we with our money can't do that. So we have to find ways to find out if someone a good entrepreneur or not. And um, honestly, that's something we're still working on. It's the, the toughest part of the entire business. Sure. I, I want to touch on something that you said that I thought was interesting, is you kind of mentioned briefly a persona of that 25-year-old entrepreneur. Um, as I told you offline, we've been doing a lot of these podcast interviews in Berlin. Um, I, I imagine the ecosystem in the Rhine Valley is slightly different. When I see Berlin, it reminds me very much of the young 25-year-old tech founder. Um, are, do you have that same type of demographics of the people that are founding companies in this region and as opposed to Berlin? Or do you see noticeable differences in the types of... Uh, startups that are were here in this region. Yeah, there is a difference. I think it's the same people or the, the same age, same education, but there is a difference in the ecosystem. Um, I always have the feeling that in Berlin, um, you know, people go to certain clubs, cafes, parties, whatever, and they they teach each other what the truth is uh, and how how it works. And of course, you have very successful companies in Berlin. And then we always, we often see founders who come home with these realities, I call them Torstraßenweisheiten, <laughs> uh, and, and they, they think they want to be like this as well. Here I have the feeling that people are more concentrated on the business, there are no parties, um, there is not such a huge network and, and they actually think more about how to build their business than building an equity story or doing what the ecosystem thinks they have to do. Hard to describe, but there definitely is a difference. And that's not only true for Cologne, that's also true for Hamburg, Munich, Karlsruhe, and other cities. Well, as a native of Cologne, um, do you have a sense of why that is? Is it really just because there's less of a social 
kind of cultural scene around startups here, or is there something more deeper ingrained that people are maybe a little more serious and focused on their businesses rather than, like you said, equity stories? Now you know that we in Kelowna are very proud of our culture here and our mentality. <laughs> but actually, I would say in this case, no, that's not the reason. I think it's the ecosystem. I think it's you know how many people are around you that tell you how you have to do it. Well, do you think that'll change? As I mean, I... You know, I come from a, a smaller town that has become the densest startup ecosystem in the world in Boulder, Colorado. Um, it's not Silicon Valley, you know, and but now it's grown and grown and grown to a point that it's starting to take on some of those characteristics. I, I assume, you know, we're all hoping that our entrepreneurial ecosystems and our own communities continue to grow. Does Cologne then have a risk of as it gets bigger and the ecosystem grows and there's more successful founders and exits and reinvestments like you're doing, that it'll start to move in that direction of Berlin? Or is there something that's keeping it grounded a little more? No, there definitely is a risk. Um, Cologne has not been very successful in building a startup ecosystem in the last 10 years. Now there are currently a lot of initiatives to change that. And I think there is the risk that exactly what you just said will happen or could happen one day. You know, our audience, I think, is a, a lot of first-time founders or, or early-stage founders. As someone that's built multiple successful companies and helped as a partner and an investor and in, in many, many more, I'm always interested in, through your lifetime of experiences, like some of those hard lessons you've learned that you would pass on. So when you are mentoring a, a founder, what are some of those key, key pieces of wisdom that you like to share? That's one of my favorites. Um, I think the key message is build a company and not an equity story. Mm -hmm. These equity stories, it sometimes works, but a lot of times there is some point in your fundraising process where it just implodes. What means building a company? Building a company means you have to take care of your revenue. Sales is the most prominent job of a founder, selling your company to employees, selling your company to customers, selling your product to companies, selling uh, to, to customers, selling your um, company to investors. So you need to be someone who's excited about your company and your product and to sell that. And so you need to generate revenue. And at the same time, what is a lot of times seen too late is you can and you should always manage your cost structure. Um, and that's something what we see in the ecosystem a lot of times. It's just about revenue. It's just about top line growth. Um, and we take, we take care about costs later on. And, or we grow out of the cost. I always say if you take care of your cost structure right from the beginning, you don't have to grow out of it, which makes it a lot cheaper and a lot easier and there's a lot less stress. So manage both sides of the balance sheet um, of the P&L, the top line generate revenue, generate profitable revenue, and at the same time, make sure that your cost structure is under control. So it's, I don't say don't invest, I just say, you know, when you do things, do them reasonably. Um, along these two messages, I think, uh, is the major difference of someone who builds a company and someone who just built an equity story. Well, you, you mentioned three points there. You know, you, you talked about, you know, not building these kind of... Uh, paper valuations, which I think we see so much be it building sustainable companies. You talked about sales and of course you talked about, you know, your, your P&L and, and some of the real rational financial sides. Um, one of my lessons in being a founder was on the sales side, having a B2B SaaS. And um, I had to learn that on the fly. You know, I had to kind of learn it as I go. My sense is, you know, you came from consulting and built your first company that way, so you were probably really strong on the finance side. But you did B2B sales as well. Did you just learn it as you go? Did you have mentors, guidance? How did you really kind of figure that out? Because it can be tricky for someone that's never done it before. It is tricky. And it's probably nothing you can study. That's the problem. And I mean, if we go back 
10 or 20 years in our normal um, economic uh, courses in, in college, there was no course, there were no classes about sales, right? It was about marketing, it was about product and all these things. And then sales just happened somewhere in the organization. So Ove Jensen from WHO is still one of the very, very few, if not the only professors in Germany that actually think and teach about sales. Coming back to your question, the most important thing is probably mentality. It, you have to have this in your, in your genes, going out there, um, talking to people, not being afraid of hearing nine times a no and waiting for the tenth time when you get a yes. That's a mentality thing. So we today look much more for the sales guy in the organization, in the team, than the CTO. Tech is something I can buy. You know, I, I'm not a tech guy. I did some programming myself, but I was able to be the manager of a tech team. But selling is something you have to do as an entrepreneur. And if the, if the head of the organization doesn't have a sales spirit, you will never get sales spirit in the organization. I'm absolutely convinced that I'm hiring a sales guy who's doing that for us will never work. So it's mentality and then it's learning on the job, asking after every turn down from a potential customer, what could I do differently? How can I come back in the back door and get in again? Um, this is probably the only way it works. But you're addressing something very um, interesting because one of the reasons why, especially VHU guys, have been so successful in the last 15 years to build startups is because sales wasn't that important. We had a lot of B2C businesses and sales was a, a strategic, logical game behind your computer where you put ads on Google and later on on Facebook and today Instagram, all these things. So you sit behind your computer, you have all kinds of KPIs and, and you can do that. That was something these guys could do. Now when it comes to B2B sales and a lot of business models today are B2B and will be B2B, um, they sit behind their computer and no one clicks on it, on their keyword, because no one knows that this new SaaS software exists. So you, all of a sudden you have to do cold calling. You have to call a Mittelständler in in Heilbronn and say, I have something I want to sell to you. Now, who do you call? How do you sell? You probably have to travel and go to him and, and you know, convince several people in the organization. That's really tough and that's old sale. Um, and that's why I think today building a startup for many of these typical finance guys is much more complicated than it has been before. And we have actually turned down companies that where we think that they have to sell very strongly in the in the field outside, uh, in, the, in, the, in the land side. And, and we haven't invested because they absolutely wanted to found in Berlin. Mm -hmm. And if you're in Berlin and each conversation with a customer that generates a thousand euro revenue means a flight to Dortmund or to Karlsruhe or to whatever Hanover, um, then it becomes very costly to do the sales. Whereas if you sit in, in Stuttgart, Frankfurt, Cologne, or these regions, uh, you sit down in the car, you have four feet of meetings in the Ruhrgebiet and you come back. So I think this has changed a lot today and um, we look at it very intensely. That's such a huge advantage in Germany because I had to spend 250 days a year flying on airplanes to get across the US to meet with clients. True, so. at least if you're sitting in the right region. That's right. right. Yeah. Fortunately, I was right in the middle of the country, so yeah. it wasn't, wasn't as bad as being in New York or or California, but you know, it's interesting what you said. Like I say this a lot to, to founders is there's only two roles in a startup. You either build stuff or you sell stuff. And ideally your builders can sell and your sellers, sellers can build. And that is indeed the Holy grail, but they're, Absolutely. they're hard to find. So it sounds to me like one of the characteristics that you really look for are founders that have that kind of sales DNA built inside of them. Because like you said, the, if the founders can't sell, you can't just hire someone to do the selling for you. I like to ask all of my guests a couple silly questions. Most of them hate it, but uh, just to provide a little bit of insight into Stefan the man, not just the entrepreneur. But um, first question I want to ask is, is there, are there any books that you're reading right now that you could recommend? Yeah, I'm actually reading several books over the year. They are all uh, Fachbücher, uh, to be honest. Um, but the one I've studied the most this summer was a book called Top Grading. Uh, it's a book about how to find the right people, how to find out in your hiring process 
if you're hiring an A person. And this is interesting from two sides. One is we try to find out if this process can help us finding the good founders, the founders that want to build entrepreneur uh, uh, companies, the founders that uh, can do the sales process. Um, so we're discussing a lot in our team right now how we can use these insights in doing a better selection. And the others, of course, that we recommend it um, to our startups because one of the major problems with startups is hiring and a lot of our portfolio companies don't do that very well. Right. That, that is one of the biggest challenges, especially in the early stages, is making sure you're getting the right team on board and a sustainable one. If you haven't done that before, it's another one of those tricky lessons. Well, the other one's a little more fun. Um, I'd be interested to know what's cycling on your playlist. My music playlist? Your music playlist. Yeah, it's probably kind of embarrassing, but uh, <laughs> I think I told you before, I'm a, a great fan of Cologne, and um, I'm organizing a concert every once a year. A private concert with uh, very old traditional Cologne songs. So right now my playlist um, are about 40 to 50 songs from the 60s to 80s um, with Kölsch music where I try to find the right playlist for this concert which will take place in uh, late summer next year. That sounds like the kind of music that you need to be drinking an ice cold Kölsch while you're listening to. It helps, yeah. but if you're a real guy from Cologne, you don't need it. You don't need Anyone else in the podcast probably needs more than one Kölsch. <laughs> Stefan Schubert, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy day to meet with us. And uh, really enjoyed hearing your story. And hopefully we can do it again sometime. Thank you. Love to. It was great fun. Well, folks, that was Stefan Schubert, founder and managing partner of STS Ventures and Cohn. If you're interested in learning more about Stefan's work, check out sts-ventures.de. Coming soon in episode 10, we'll speak with Tiago Cesar of Consativa, one of Germany's first and only pharmaceutical cannabis suppliers. His story will offer insights into one of the most fascinating regulatory contexts in Germany and what might be the next great emergent industry in Europe. Bis nächstes Mal.